In this video, we'll talk about general guidelines for odd object training. We'll look at body weight training and see if it has a place in athletic development. We'll compare machines and free weight training, and we'll talk about some core stability training ideas. Dr. Gooden here, back with another lecture. At the bell. Here we go. Yeah. 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 I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology here at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we'll be covering part of chapter 16 from the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning textbook. We'll discuss odd object training and some general guidelines surrounding that, body weight training, free weight versus machine training, core training, and instability training. Okay, so we've got a lot to cover. Let's dive right into the material. This info, like I said, comes from the textbook Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, published by the NSCA written by doctors Half and Berninger. And we're gonna be talking about alternative modes and non-traditional implements in training. So what are we gonna cover? We're gonna talk about basic guidelines for performing resistance exercise with these alternative modes and non-traditional implements. We'll describe some of the benefits of things like body weight training activities, identify benefits and limitations associated with direct core training and perhaps spending too much time on that um, in favor uh, instead of other big core lifts. We'll identify appropriate technique and, tech and key technical flaws associated with some alternative modes of exercise. And then we'll appropriately determine how to apply resistance bands and chains to traditional ground-based free weight exercises. And then finally, determine when it is appropriate to use alternative methods and non-traditional implements in our training programs. Now, when we're talking about non-traditional weight training or, or modes of resistance training, we're talking about anything that's not a barbell or a dumbbell. So really in this textbook, they characterize it as anything that is body weight training, bands or chains, or using kettlebells, strongman training techniques like farmer's walks and loaded carries, keg presses, log presses, tire flips, all of those types of things that really can spice up training and keep it interesting, but that might require a very specific sort of nuanced technical approach because uh, training with a barbell or with dumbbells, it's very predictable and symmetrical and there's no sort of odd objects to deal with. But in these alternative modes, there might be some additional considerations for us to think about when we're programming them in for our athletes or for the general population folks that we're working with. So some general guidelines almost no matter what type of lift or type of object we're talking about, we want to ensure proper body alignment via selection of a stable body position. So typically knees slightly bent if you're standing in an athletic stance with feet shoulder width apart, right? We all typically want to have a proud chest and shoulders back, just a typical stable, strong posture. Uh, this is regardless of whatever type of exercise they're doing, whether it's standing or seated, uh, most of these things apply. We want to keep the spine in line with a slight arch, but not overarch. We definitely don't want rounding. However, sometimes, especially in strongman, let's say if you're doing an atlas stone or some type of a log press, there can be some um, upper back rounding and sometimes some lower back rounding. However, as long as we have a strong enough athlete and if that's a sport that they're competing in, this can be okay as long as we're still bracing appropriately. Now, if the exercise is a freestanding ground-based exercise, the athlete's feet should be placed slightly wider than shoulder width apart and remain flat on the ground. And then we want to use an alternate grip for exercise based on the type of exercise performed. So in a lot of these non-traditional modes of exercise, there are um, like fat grip, deadlift type movements. So using an alternate grip under an overhand allows the athlete to uh, hold onto the bar and to keep it from slipping out of the grip. Now, if you're training grip directly, then you might want to use double overhand so that they have to actually use their finger and wrist flexors to hold onto the bar and they don't get the advantage of using that alternate grip. More general guidelines, athletes should, should exhale during the concentric portion of the exercise and inhale during the eccentric. So on the way down, they're inhaling, taking in air and on the concentric, they're exhaling, pushing that air out. And now that, that is only if they're not doing a Valsalva maneuver during the lift, which during maximal attempts, typically we want to coach our athletes to do the Valsalva maneuver and further protect their spine. And especially if they're wearing a belt for this, then the belt is essentially useless if you're not bracing against it. And as it says here, with 
heavy loads above 80% of the maximum voluntary contraction, um, or with lighter loads perform to failure. So if you're doing a repetition max, the Valsalva maneuver may be a useful technique for maintaining spinal stability. Now we have to remember that in these movements, there's a lot of inherent asymmetry and instability. Uh, a log clean and press, for instance, is much different than a barbell clean and jerk. In a barbell clean and jerk, the athlete expresses their power very precisely and with a sort of grace that makes them look like some kind of a barbell Jedi as they explode uh, with quite heavy loads, but then get under it quickly. And they're moving through a very precise um, joint ranges of motion and they have this dialed in technique and it's a very precise application. Whereas a log clean and press, this is more of a brute force method. And so we have to pay very careful attention to making sure that our athletes are learning, the, learning to do these with proper bracing techniques and with all of the safety uh, measures like belts or per, potentially like um, elbow or wrist wraps um, or knee wraps that they might need. Okay, so those are some very general guidelines that apply to a wide range of these non-traditional exercises. Let's talk specifically about a few different types of non-traditional resistance training methods. And the first one is body weight training. And the text includes this. I wouldn't say that this is non-traditional because body weight training is one of the oldest styles of resistance training. It's one of the oldest forms because before we could even forge metal into barbells, we had our bodies to, you know, to resist with our muscles. So I think body weight training is not alternative, but we're going to talk about it here anyways. So some of the benefits, um, body weight training is specific to each individual's anthropometrics. And what this means is that they learn to leverage their own anthropometrics. Like somebody might have long arms and that might make them better uh, at maybe doing some sort of like a monkey bar, or like hanging challenge, but maybe worse at something like pull-ups. Someone with short arms would be better at pull-ups. Uh, somebody with, let's say, the right proportion of, of femur to tibia length would be better at sprinting than someone else um, versus someone else with shorter femurs might be better at squatting. So your anthropometrics, you can really play to your strengths. It often includes uh, closed chain based exercises. So uh, where the distal portion of the limb is fixed, let's say push-ups versus dumbbell bench press. Dumbbell bench press is open chain because the distal part of the limb is not fixed in space. Whereas with push-ups, your hands are fixed on the ground and so it's a closed chain exercise and we know that we can develop more force in a closed chain environment. We also tend to strengthen several muscle groups at once. So most of our body weight exercises are multi-joint. Squats, push-ups, pull-ups, those types of things, they involve more than one joint and so we're hitting a lot of muscles at once. It develops relative strength. So everything with body weight training is relative to your own body weight. So one way to get better at body weight training is yes, to get stronger, but another way is to decrease your body fat percentage, increase your fat free mass to uh, fat mass ratio, essentially to increase the amount of muscle tissue that you have at the given body weight. It improves body control as well. So unlike maybe something like machine training where you just sit down and you, you know, select a weight and the machine literally just moves along a fixed plane of motion, with body weight training, we learn to move our own bodies around in space. And that's really good as far as kinesthetic awareness goes and the development of general athleticism. And finally, it's just low cost. If you, um, you know, if you follow any type of uh, calisthenic type person or someone like the Bioneer on YouTube, then you know that one of the huge draws for calisthenics is that you can do it anywhere. Really, arguably, the only piece of equipment you really need is a bar or a perch or something to hang on so you can do chin-ups. But other than that, you basically can get a full body workout with just the body weight alone. Now some drawbacks if we're talking about training athletes for performance, and I know that's what a lot of you are hoping to do or are currently doing with your career is training athletes. Now, yes, definitely body weight training has a huge place, has a huge part in how we train athletes because our athletes' bodies and their awareness of their body in space and relative strength, all of those things are super important, but we can't fully overload the force and the power capacity of an athlete. Like you can't generate maximum lower body force or upper body force with just body weight exercises. It's just not possible because our bodies only weigh so much, we can't add load to it. So to truly 
to truly train the entire spectrum of that force velocity curve, we have to use some sort of external resistance, whether that's in the form of weights or bands or chains um, or some sort of a pulley device or machines, whatever it is, we have to in introduce some sort of external resistance if we want to get our athletes as strong and as powerful as possible. So training with body weight only, probably not optimal as far as well-rounded athletic development. Does it get you stronger and particularly increase your strength endurance? Yes, yes, definitely. So it's not a bad way to train. It just may not be a complete way to train for our athletes. Now, moving on to core stability and balance training methods. One thing really quick, I don't necessarily like about the terminology in this textbook. They call core training, uh, meaning abdominal training, and core exercises, meaning primary lifts that you would do first in a session. They, they use the word core for both of those. I think that's a little bit confusing. So in, in this case, we're talking about midsection work or what some people think of as abdominal work, although it's more than just your abdominals. Anyways, core training, core stability training and balance methods. This is an anatomical focus. So we're focusing on one region of the body and that's the anatomical core. Now the anatomical core includes all of the soft tissues with proximal attachments that originate on the axial skeleton. It is suggested that increasing an athlete's core stability will result in a better foundation for force production in the upper and lower extremities. So what this is saying is essentially that a strong core allows your body to effectively brace and transmit force from the lower to the upper body and from the upper to the lower body. If you have a weak core, and those muscles such as rectus abdominis, your internal and external obliques, your quadratus lumborum, if those muscles can't contract in a synchronized way to transduce force, transmit force, that's the right word, transmit force from the lower to, to the upper body, then you're going to have all kinds of leakages in your energy, energy leakages, force leakages, um, that result in a less than efficient application of force. Now, if the entire purpose of the core muscles are to enhance our ability to produce force at the upper and the lower extremities, then doing only traditional isolation type of core movements, let's say crunches or bicycles or V-ups or even planks, those types of isolation movements, while they might strengthen our core, they may not strengthen it in a way that transfers into athletic performance. So, so does the core fire in the type of way that produces a rigid base of support when you're going into a cutting movement? Or does it not really fire and it's soft and you lose all kinds of energy and force production when you're cutting and therefore slowing yourself down and potentially risking injury, right? And that's the difference. So um, these isolation exercises that typically involve either dynamic or isometric muscle actions, um, they often do so without the contribution of the lower or upper extremities. And like I said, planks or crunches, those types of things. And so those are fine for getting stronger in the midsection, but we also need to employ movements that synchronize upper and lower body. And really, and this is a key point here, ground-based free weight exercises appear to offer similar, or in some cases, most cases, greater activation of the core when compared with traditional isolation exercises designed to engage the core. So what does this mean? This means that your squats, your deadlifts, your chin-ups, your power cleans, your snatches, those types of big compound multi-joint barbell free weight movements, those might be better at training the core to engage in a sport specific way than isolation work. So for all of the runners out there who may not lift weights, but do like a targeted core training uh, circuit a few times a week or soccer players who do the same thing or for people who spend an inordinate amount of time training the midsection, you might be better off training with big multi-joint uh, bilateral heavy and explosive movements instead, or at least, at least trading out some of that time that you're spending training just the core, because this will synchronize your core's ability to contract at the right moment at key force production times and to stiffen at the key times that you need it to in your actual sport. Now, the next topic to talk about is machines versus free weight exercises. Um, and this is under the heading of balance training methods just because machines offer a much more stable uh, movement than free weight exercises. So getting into things like balance and proprioception. So machines offer greater stability and may result in a better ability to target 
specific muscle groups. And this is why we often use machines for isolation work, especially after we do our free weight exercises first. So let's say that you have a bodybuilder or someone else who wants to increase the size of their muscles, they're in a hypertrophy phase, maybe they do their squats and then they do their lunges and then now they're onto their third movement of the day, they're already fatigued, but we still need some more volume of training. Well, why not put them on a hack squat machine or a Smith machine or some type of a leg press so we can isolate the quads, but it's really stable so that even though they're fatigued, they can still get a really, really good stimulus off of that third movement of the day and then really hammer the quads into oblivion. So that's a great use for machines. Another great use for machines is if you're coming back from injury. So maybe you really need the stability offered by a machine that forces you into a specific plane of motion. You can't deviate outside of that. And so you're at very little risk of hurting yourself. That might be another great use of machines. We know that free weights cause greater activation of stabilizer muscles and offer the ideal combination of specificity and instability. And I say it's ideal because in most of our sports, even sports that require balance and coordination and stability, we don't play on unstable surfaces. Um, you know, the last time I checked, we don't hold soccer games in the middle of an ongoing earthquake and we don't, uh, you know, you don't play basketball on some sort of like a bounce house type floor, although that would be awesome. Uh, if anyone remembers trampoline ball, that was, that was a cool sport that I think should stick around. But aside from those things, we play on stable surfaces. So training on an unstable surface, really it, it does two things. One is less sport specific because like I said, we don't play on unstable surfaces. And two, it decreases the force production because the body, the brain is saying, oh, hey, hold up, we're really unstable, we're uncomfortable. If we exert too much force, we could risk injury. And so it actually, um, it, it doesn't allow you to reach those higher threshold motor units and generate as much force as you would otherwise be able to. The more stable you are, the more force you can actually produce. And so free weights are a nice balance between instability, so having to fire those stabilizers in a, in a um, very specific way, a uh, sport specific way, and stability, meaning that you're not like standing on a wobble board with a BOSU ball under each leg and trying to you know, squat a tsunami bar or whatever those things are called. So where did instability training come from? Really, it comes from the world of physical therapy and athletic training where these return to play protocols would use unstable surfaces in a very specific way, a very smart way to um, encourage the athlete to develop a co-contraction around that joint where the agonist and the antagonist are contracting at the same time. And this creates stability. And this is very good for somebody who's coming back from like an ACL surgical repair or who just had a hamstring pull or something and they're getting back onto the field. You want that co-contraction for stability purposes. However, it's not very good for improving power output and strength output. It's not very good for achieving high velocities in your sprints or your jumps, because if you have both of those things contracting at once, it's like your muscles are working against each other. So I, I think what happened in the last 10 to 20 years is, is as uh, uh, fields like physical therapy began to take on more and more of the responsibility of uh, you know, returning athletes who were injured back to training, uh, people just started looking at what they did in the clinic and thinking, oh, these exercises got the athletes to be able to train again. Maybe they're exercises that we should always include in the program. And to some extent, sure, prehab work is fine, but I think we've gone too far in including these therapeutic modalities in our performance training. And the two are different. What gets you back to training does not get you to achieving your peak performance. We need to do something different. So I think that um, you know, stability and balance training and unstable surface training has its place in prehab, in therapy, but not in high performance uh, situations. Yes, maybe there are some cases where, you know, in a very sports specific context, we might want to work on proprioceptive balance stuff, but for the most part, we should stick with heavy, explosive, ballistic, reactive, types of movements with our athletes. Furthermore, while unstable surface training might increase core muscle activation too, um, it can actually lower force output of an exercise by up to 30% or even more than that. The key point here is that ground-based free weight exercises like squats, deadlifts, and the Olympic lifts involve a degree of instability that allows for simultaneous development of all links of the kinetic chain, 
offering a much better training stimulus for the development of core stability and the enhancement of athletic performance than do instability device-based exercises. Whew, that was a long sentence. Really what it says is do your squats, do your deadlifts, do your bench presses, do your push presses, your power cleans, all of that. And for the most part, you're gonna be good to go as far as unstable surfaces or core training. You don't need all of that. Maybe we sprinkle in some of that very uh, in very precise ways and for those athletes that need it and in targeted areas, but the meat and potatoes are the big powerful lifts, the lifts that make you strong and powerful and fast. Okay, you guys, that does it for this lecture video, but click on over to the next video, which will deal with the second half of chapter 16, uh, talking about variable resistance training. So things like bands and chains and eccentric accentuated loading, all of that juicy, fun, interesting training stuff that can spice up your training programs. And we'll see uh, how beneficial it is and talk about why it can be an important piece for your training programs. All right, let me know if you have any questions down in the comments below. I'd be happy to interact with you guys there. Um, as always, reach out to me via email or here on YouTube to say hi. It's great being with you guys. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Force transduction. I can talk. I need some water. Stable surface training. And one other thing which I'm forgetting. Dang it. Very well. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology. I don't know.